I keep this as informal and open to questions as possible, so stop me at any time. Um, I didn't have a lot of time to, to prep for this. So what you see in, in front of you is actually something that um, an ex-colleague and brilliant designer, Carolyn Stamps, who's currently at Good, did for me when we presented at South by Southwest last year. So it's not totally tailored to this. So then once again, just please ask any questions that you have. I did try to update as much as possible based on what Janet said you guys might be interested in. But, um, but yeah, here you go. So to, to start off, um, my, my bio is a little bit um, outdated. And currently what I do at Participant is really more execution of campaigns that my brilliant colleagues largely research and develop, and then I am responsible for implementation. And with that implementation comes managing all the financials and all of the legal aspects of those campaigns. As a result, I feel like I'm probably well equipped to talk, to talk about participants' business model and how that may be comparable to other companies that do similar-ish things. Um, so that's, that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today, what participants' role <coughs> is within the industry, from my perspective, and then what we do. What we do is completely nuanced, and it's not really be done, being done anywhere else, so it's an experiment. So um, please just take this as, this is my experience with participants, this is our experience within the film industry, and um, I make no claims about what is actually impactful, I can only tell you what I've learned there. Um, we function very much as a startup that way. So before we get started, I wanted to show some a participant reel. Our history will be what we make of it. Just once in a while, let us exalt the importance of ideas and information. Good night, and good luck. This is what we always do. We always go in with our ideals, and we change the world, and then we leave. But that ball, though, he keeps on bouncing. You can't win. Whether you win or lose, you stand up. He was arrested. Please, don't forget to bust me. They have been a single day of peace talks in the Holy Land in six years. Not many people know it or care. I care. Global warming is really not a political issue so much as a, a moral issue. If we allow that to happen, it is deeply unethical. Still, you know, the ultimate goal isn't divesting from Sudan, it's ending the genocide in Darfur. Being his friend will carry you home. Why am I being investigated? Why am I being investigated? It's running out. The fear of the truth silenced me. The industry doesn't want you to know the truth about what you're eating. I dream of flowers will bloom in the streets again, and kites will fly in the skies. When I'm mad to tell you something, you know, it involves something great. Like, I told you it's true. material is a little bit dated. Um, since within the past several years, Participant Media, along with a number of Jeff Scholes companies, who's the founder of Participant, has made an effort to identify those issue areas that we think impact the most people and therefore have the, the power to um, create the most good and have tried to build a slate against those issues. So there are five key issues. Um, that we really look to kind of align a lot of our content around, and that's water scarcity, pandemics, nuclear non-proliferation, um, the Middle East, and climate change. So a lot of the work that we've been putting out within the past few years are, are in line with kind of that overall idea of sticking to that slate. There are a number of films that don't necessarily fall in line with, those slate, with that slate, and we've 
every project is different, and I can probably identify why we decided to pick up that project or not. Um, so this is <clears throat> this is um, a bit of a guide on what we do, and again, like I said, kind of my perspective of what we do, and. Um, what is not included in here is some background on participant, which I'll go through relatively quickly. Our founder, Jeff Skoll, was the first founding president at eBay, which is where he made his billions of dollars. Jeff Skoll is, um, had wanted to find some sort of way to create impact through storytelling and um, decided on um, making, building a movie company, and Participant is, is one of his um, brainchilds, and we've been in existence now for about five, six years, um, and have completely evolved and grown and changed within that. But he has another of other companies that tackle these key issue areas in different ways, a foundation, um, impact investment fund, and things like that. Okay, so next slide. So um, we'll talk a little bit about Participant's model first, um, just because I want to be able to address any questions that you guys may have about it. We can go to the next slide. Um, so Participant makes, makes a lot of films. We're actually expanding to make more than about six films a year, but that's previously what we've, um, what we've been contributing every year. All, all of these films are very different, and um, we, some, are, some are acquired. For example, the, the top two, page one and circumstance, weren't actually the production wasn't actually financed by a participant. They were, they were films that we picked up at Sundance. But every film and every project has a complete different life, um, different uh, partners and producers and um, distributors. So they are very, very different. And therefore, um, the foundations of their social action campaigns are also very different. So, um, And obviously, the issues that they're tackling are very different. So every project really is very unique. And the process is very different. That's why it, one of the reasons it's pretty hard to put a template to what we do. Um, but now our slate will will be even bigger. We're looking to double that every year moving forward. <coughs> Next. So there are other there are a lot of other projects and a lot of other films that, like I said, are comparable to Participant. I think that they're all very different. I don't know if you guys do. You guys recognize the the titles up here. So um, Earth, obviously, I'm hoping that everybody probably has heard about that, but they, <laughs> really interest, they did some really interesting things around box office sales with Earth where money was donated through the Nature Conservancy. I thought it was a really interesting play. They raised lots of money. The Walmart movie, um, <clears throat> Brave New Films, is a, a production company that I feel like Parkinson is, is compared to a lot. And then Gasson, which obviously was um, nominated for an Oscar last year, and a really good documentary. And um, and the life of, of that film, I feel like we we often get compared to a lot, but is, is very different. Um, first time filmmaker there, and like I said, a really great film, very issue specific, um, but different than Participant. So there are a couple of reasons why I think Participant is different. Next. Um, so cause marketing, I think, is something that um, we we're, were supposed to talk about today. So cause marketing is a term that I'm not super fond of. I was trying to identify this morning why I didn't really like this this term. And I think one of the reasons it um, bothers me is just that it it's often either misunderstood or it's put on things in a misrepresented way. Like it's used to identify things that aren't really cause marketing. And I don't really feel that what participant media does is cause marketing. So, um, so let me explain. <laughs> and these are some these are some other terms here that I've heard before that are often kind of brought into this whole world. And I think again are each very different. Um, and we don't spend a lot of time really identifying or defining what we do. But in an effort to define for the sake of understanding, I I would identify cause marketing as a way to effectively market and promote a particular cause. So with regards to our work at Participant, cause marketing is a natural um, side effect or result of a lot of the work that we do. But I would say the, the work that we're typically trying to do is, is more in depth and more comprehensive than a cause marketing plan. Not to say that there's anything wrong with cause marketing at all. Um, a lot of the times we're able to help effectively market the work of a nonprofit, for example, through our film campaigns. 
um, which could ultimately be very impactful. It's just not necessarily the crux of what we're ultimately trying to do with our songs and our campaigns. Um, so what we're trying to do, and where we fall within this landscape, and I think what makes participant media different, is that there is definitely a company-wide commitment to a double bottom line. So we have about 80 people within the company, and um, and I would say every single one of us is on board to like be a do-gooder, if that makes any sense. And it's really... Um, it's a real, a real actual commitment, so, which continues to impress me, actually. And for those of you that have come from a really corporate environment, I used to work in sales, this whole idea of not being committed to just marketing something as good, but actually genuinely wanting to make a positive impact with whatever you do and holding yourself accountable to that is something that arguably every one of our employees is, is on board with. And that in and of itself, I think, is unique. Um, the approach that we take on key issues is always a systemic appro approach. So, um, what I mean when, what I mean by that is, first and foremost, and this I think is key, is being able to identify those issues that we really want to focus on. Those issues that are um, ultimately we think can create the most harm and the most good. Um, makes us already a bit strategic. So really trying to focus on some of these key issues and building a library of content around them rather than just a single film, um, I think is key. But the systemic approach comes in where on every film that we tackle, um, we research it very thoroughly. We have a researcher on our staff that is genius, and she makes sure that we're all up to date and that we know all know exactly what we're talking about. So if we're ever on the red carpet ourselves, or if we're ever in any sort of press event, we can accurately and adequately speak to the issue that our film's about. Even if the issue is only part of, part of the narrative of a narrative film, we can still really speak to it in an intelligent way. And as a result, we can identify the leverage points within that issue where change is possible. So if we understand an issue really well, and we can say, if this was different within this issue, and we were able to change it, then we could actually make a huge scalable impact on this issue. And that's a systemic approach, as opposed to um, addressing some of the systems, or the symptoms of an issue, um, which we internally kind of call like um, a band-aid approach. We try not to use any band-aids in our campaigns. We try to actually address whatever the wound or the problem is. Um, and the other differentiator, I think, is the films that we work on and are able to work on are um, larger films. So we're working with, I think, key players within the, within the industry, um, both in terms of filmmakers and other studios. Um, we have, as a result, our, our, um, our distribution of our films is not necessarily guaranteed, but we've never worked on a project. Sorry, that's a lie. We've had one project that hasn't gotten distribution and been sold and, and um, gotten distribution in theaters, but everything else that we've done ha has, which if you've worked in film, know is a feat in and of itself. There's so many films that are made that you will never see, and really, really good films. Um, okay, next. So, shooting in the dark. This is this is basically the part one of um, the social action campaign. A lot of times we're starting with a film um, after it's greenlit, but before we've actually really seen any film content on it. And as a result, um, our start is really with analyzing and um, getting to know the issue and the players within that issue really super well. Um, so it's difficult sometimes to be able to do that because I think a lot of our most successful campaigns, the theme, the the tone of the campaign matches the tone of the film. And if you haven't seen any footage, that's pretty difficult to do. Um, so this is we, how we get started. It's, again, a bit of an experiment. Um, we like to start as early as we possibly can. Um, for documentaries, the process is almost always very different than it is for our narrative features. Um, and that's a result of a lot of different factors. But um, I would argue that a lot of our documentary films have been a little bit more issue-driven, and the filmmakers have been more open to wanting to create impact in the social action campaign, so they've been more willing to kind of let us into the process early, and we can often work together in a more collaborative way. Okay, so 
This one is um, where a lot of my colleagues um, come in. And in my earlier years at Participant, I've been a participant for about five years now, um, I was responsible for this aspect as well. Now that we've grown so much, we've really had to divide the development, which is listening to the experts and the non-experts and the execution, which is largely what I what I handle. But based on my experience with like reading, for example, this is often just doing a lot of informational interviews. So talking to everybody that is supposed to be somebody within the space of the issue um, is, is really how we get started on this process. And I feel like it's really easy to identify once you start these types of conversations who the experts and the non-experts are, despite what those people say about themselves or what other people in the space say about them. So here's an example as well of kind of identifying the leverage points that I had mentioned before. Um, a lot of the stuff that we talk about, um, a lot of the stuff that we'll start researching are, are points within an issue where you have maybe a really good story, a touching emotional story, um, or other points where you have really timely, um, a really timely policy environment that exists around that issue where there might be legislation that's pending right when your film is about to release, which could make a really um, interesting campaign. And bringing all of those different landscapes together and figuring out basically where the intersection is of what is timely, what is really potentially powerful for that issue, and what will your audience actually do. So with every film that we have, identifying the audience is, is obviously really important. And figuring out what they will respond to and how much of their time you think that they'll give you is kind of the crux of a lot of what we do. So with Crazies, for example, which was a horror movie, which by and large appeals to 13 to 18 year old boys, we knew we probably had about 30 seconds of our audience's time to give them some sort of information about a social cause. Um, and therefore, we built campaigns that were largely kind of tech savvy, alternative um, reality games and things like that, as opposed to something like Food Inc where we built a campaign that really appealed to moms and people that we thought would be interested in child nutrition legislation. Are there any questions about any of this? I have a, a quick question. I just want to make sure I understand. <coughs> Participant Films makes the films. You're doing the campaigns around the films so that people do something after they've seen the films. So yes. Want to make sure I yeah, that's exactly right. So Participant Media is a production company, meaning we produce and finance films. Um, and then we bring those films into a festival circuit, typically where we look for a seller who then distributes the films to exhibitors. Um, as part and parcel of working with a project, so let's say we have a film come in, um, a submission for a film that is not originally generated by a participant, but is an amazing project. As part of receiving financing for that film, that filmmaker or other production company is obligated legally, typically, to have the social action component to the marketing of the film. And then that social action campaign is then marketed alongside of the film. Some filmmakers and some studios are very excited about, well, I don't know if I'd argue that any studios were excited about a social action campaign that we work on, but um, some largely get what we do and we're able to, to explain to them in a um, kind of metric-defied way of how the social action campaign can actually help increase box office. Um, and other times it's just something that is a given because it's legally part of their P&A spend and it's something that we do without a lot of support from the studio. So the idea is how do we give people something to do once they've seen this movie and get moved by the time? The, the idea is always if and when somebody sees one of our films and they want to do something about it, they have a framework in which to do that something that we've identified would ultimately have the most impact that we think it could possibly have in this issue space. Okay. Just to make sure yeah. So whatever that person is doing, we believe that that is what they are most likely to do because of the, the time that we assume they're going to be spending on our website or after the film or what have you. That could ultimately drive that issue forward the most. Questions? Cool. Has anybody here previously worked in film or familiar with the film industry? <coughs> Quick question, what percentage of your films are people that already have their ideas ready to come to you for financing versus like generated 
That's a really good question. So, um, the, so like I said, the life of every film is different. Um, the Beaver, for example, which was the Jodie Foster directed film last year, she, when they came to us, they already had it cast. I think they actually already had it largely shot and were looking for like post-production funding. Um, the water doc that we're releasing this year was completely self-generated. So we wanted to do a film about water scarcity. We hired the director, we hired the producer, we did all of the production in-house. Waiting for Superman was the same. We worked with Davis for years on that project and worked with him throughout the development of that project before it came to market. So it wasn't a submission, but I believe we still receive like over a thousand submissions of other projects every year. And we produce up until now about six. Any other questions? Cool. Okay, so creating the cocktail pitch of the film, the cocktail party pitch of the film is, um, no different than as a business school student, I'm sure whatever, if you are entrepreneurial in spirit, then whatever your two-liner um, is to somebody that you're looking to either help get, help give you financing or help support you in some way. This is the same exact thing. Um, and being able to kind of boil down everything that you want to do in the campaign down to two sentences is an exercise in and of itself in, um, in trying to make sure you are harnessing your ideas in the most, uh, I hate to use the word catchy, but in the most catchy and most um, effective way. Because part of the part of this whole process really is gaining the support of everybody else that you're going to be in contact with, both your audience and the nonprofits or other brands or other people that you're working with on the campaign. Um, oh, so I really like this um, phrase actually that Carolyn came up with. At some time, at some point, you have to take on the responsibility of being a voice in this space. It. It's difficult, um, as a film company, obviously, to come into an issue area that can be as nuanced as childhood hunger and pretend that you have anything really to say on the issue. And we're well aware of that, <coughs> which is why our research period and development period is often so super long. So it's really important that, like I said, we can speak intelligently on this issue. We really understand all the nuances. We understand the people that are working in this area, who doesn't get along and who does get along and who's willing to collaborate and cooperate. And um, at some point, I think it's really important that we formulate our own opinions, we decide what we think is best for our campaign and for the issue, and then we start to really stand behind that, those statements. And. Um, it's, it's interesting to see also how that plays out within the issue space. There was a really important piece of legislation at the end of 2010 about um, nuclear non-proliferation. And before there was a huge um, lobby day on Congress, uh, some of the key players, key organizations that were organizing that lobby day actually called participants to ask us what we would do to support. And the fact that these are key organizations that are calling a film company about nuclear nonproliferation policy, I think says a lot about how well we try to really understand and insert ourselves into these issues. So I was printing letters to various senators for three days straight for that mm -hmm. one. Um, Okay, and, and this is kind of part of this process, being able to, once you've, once you've sat down with all of these experts in this space and really understood the issue, trying to figure out um, what our role needs to be and what we think can really move the issue forward. Um, for better or worse, one of the lessons that I've learned in since um, being a participant but also working at Amnesty International is you discover within the nonprofit and NGO world, particularly within certain issue areas, there's a ton of competition. And often that competition is just as bad, if not stronger, than what you see in a corporate environment. With the exception of, and I think what makes that different is we don't expect it to be there. For whatever reason, we assume that people that are doing good are all going to work together and everybody's really happy. When the reality is that often these people are competing for funding from a small group of foundations, and they're often not collaborative at all. In fact, they often have really contentious relationships with one another. And so being able to step back and understand the environment of those relationships, being able to say, what do we really think is good for the issue? How can we bring people together in a collaborative way that will be, again, good for the issue? And, um, and then being able to just move forward in that and, and 
rejecting requests that we don't think line up with our philosophy on the issue, and, and trying to be a bridge to bring different parties together. We're experiencing some, a lot of contention within the food space. We experienced it to a certain degree on Food Inc., and even more so with a food film that we're releasing this year, where <clears throat> people that work on nutrition issues and people that work on hunger issues are often not on the same page at all. Um, and it, I feel like it may sound really arrogant from somebody that is coming from a media perspective to say, what on earth are you guys doing? Why aren't we working together on this? But that's, that's often the case. And so being sensitive to that and compassionate to that, but also being able to do what you think is best for the issue is one of our biggest hurdles and challenges. Um, we can skip this. This is kind of the same thing, having different approaches. Yeah? Um, can I ask a related question and tell me if I'm getting ahead of something? No, not at all. Um, I, I remember when I saw the code, mm -hmm. um, being particularly interested in the, the actions you can take at the end or the recommendations or for more information, these kinds of things. And um, my husband and I happened to be very friendly with one of the photographers on the film and mm. we were in conversation with him while the film was being made and when it was nominated and kind of checked in with him just because you know, it was fun. It was yeah. Really fun film. And I remember so many of the things that he shared about this is how you can take action or kind of the, the inside scoop on some of these things were not, I was expecting to see some of those in the recommendations at the end. Like, for example, never go to SeaWorld. It's the worst place in the world. Never go to SeaWorld. Um, and it, it occurred to me then and it's occurring to me now, it must be really hard to have to decide when, what would happen if you put at the end of a film, and by the way, boycott SeaWorld. Yeah. So I'm wondering Which we're you, never allowed to do. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about kind of what you're allowed to do, or how do you make decisions about, like you said, what's going to be the key recommendation that would really change things, or that would persuade people in the context of both that you're trying to unite all these different organizations that you're working with, but also if you really do gain a a not popular insight in the midst of this that the public really could act on, but maybe you're just not in a position for sometimes obvious, sometimes not so obvious reasons yeah. to make note. Yeah, and sometimes it's not just as simple as boycott SeaWorld is a really negative thing and you don't want to leave an audience with, an, with any sort of negative sentiment, at least not negative sentiment that's going to leave them lifeless as opposed to feeling empowered. Sometimes it's that um, on Food Inc., for example, we really wanted to be able to say boycott all sodas because sodas are categorically one of the easiest ways to become more nutritious is, and to avoid, um, you know, genetically modified, to avoid, sorry, in the <laughs> sense, but it would have been a super easy thing to do, but one of the funding partners happened to have super large investments in Pepsi. And that was what restricted us from being able to say things. So that type of stuff happens, and it's gross, and you work around it. Um, but so to answer your question, um, it happens on every film. So there's always a conversation on every film and every campaign of what are we allowed to say and what are we not allowed to say. And again, there are different reasons why we're not allowed to say some things. Um, with Disney, for example, on The Hell, which everyone fell in love with that film. Um, and we were really excited about the film, but one of the ideas that we had at the very beginning of the campaign was doing something about current domestic workers' rights. And no one really gravitated to the idea. Um, not because um, they were opposed to advocating for current domestic rights, we just didn't think we could get a lot of attention around it. Um, it wasn't particularly sexy, it wasn't really in line with the thematics of the film. And, um, and so as a result, we waited and we did some real advocacy around it, around DVD, and it was really successful. And we had a campaign that was around storytelling and kind of finding the courage to share your story um, around the theatrical release of the campaign, and I thought it was always also really successful. So sometimes it's just a matter of what we think is, is going to work. Um, but it happens on every film. Like, I'm happy to go into details on, on and other films, but it's um, it's always a conversation of what you can and can't say. Um, politically, there are so many people that are, films are so expensive to make, and there are so many people involved on every single film that you're in some sort of way beholden to. Sometimes the conversation is, this particular person doesn't want us to say this, do we have to listen to them? 
Like, is it going to cause too much fallout if we ignore what it is that they're saying? And those conversations happen too. But ultimately, our goal is to figure out what, where we think we can do the most good and to move forward in that, and then to politely explain to other people that aren't on board um, why we're moving in that direction and if their objections are, are valid. Um, because they're really important or because their objections are legitimately valid, then we take a step back and we reevaluate. Just a follow-up question. What measures or staff do you have in place to gauge success? Okay, so that's coming up. All right. So we'll talk about mm -hmm. that. And that actually is something that is currently under real evaluation and involvement at participants. So I think it's a really interesting conversation. Uh, Okay, so this is, we work with a lot of different people in every campaign. Um, whoever is really interested in what we're doing, both issue-wise, people that really want to get involved in the film because they really like the film. Um, sometimes we, um, and this happens too, we think our film is really good and it hits all of the, the right spots in terms of the issue and the people that are working on that issue and in a really powerful spot to help us out um, don't like the movie for one reason or another, and so they don't want anything to do with the film. And that's something that we um, work around. And as a result, that may lead us to working with other people. We've had some really um, successful campaigning with brands on Food Inc. We had a great um, uh, collaboration with Chipotle that I thought was really successful and I thought was really strategic for um, the life of the campaign. Um, and other times we're not able to to have as much success with brands. We've tried some things that haven't been as successful. So um, we continue to be open, though, to the idea of not just working with nonprofit partners. I think the idea of only working with people that are 501c3s is um, is not participant. We're open to working with whoever we think can have an impact. Okay, so. Once we have done all this work and then we see the movie, we may have to readjust because of the movie. Um, we can move forward. You can go again. Um, so we rewrite the goals if we need to. And if you skip forward, I think there's an example here of the help. Um, do you want to skip one more, Janet? Yeah, we originally, in, in the help, we, we had a slightly different play on storytelling. I think what we ended up with was really great. We worked with the Moth on the help and um, trained students, some students from largely underserved communities, um, on how to tell their story. So a lot of kids end up sharing their own story about a courageous moment in their life in front of three, four hundred people. It was pretty amazing, actually. The metrics for that, interestingly enough, are probably not great because it was a live event as opposed to something online, which is really easy to scale. But um, but I would have I wouldn't have changed it at all. It was a really amazing campaign, in my opinion. Oh, sorry. The Moth is a storytelling group. They do a lot of storytelling events here in LA. If you guys have never been to a Moth event, you really have to go. It's kind of like a um, it's a storytelling version of a poetry slam. If any of you guys have ever been to a poetry slam, and there's often voting that happens and. Then their live, event, their live main stage events are with storytellers like Malcolm Gladwell and a bunch of really well-known people who they also train. So that was interesting when we were recruiting like celebrities and the moth told us, no, we need to train them. And these are people that don't really want or need training, but whatever. Um, okay, so tying our strategy with the marketing of the film, every film that we work on, we work very closely with the distributor's marketing arm just to make sure that wherever we can find alignment, we are finding alignment. So whenever there are a number of field screenings that Disney was doing for the help, for example, we had postcards at all of those screenings talking about our social action campaign and things like that. So everything is connected. Um, this is, I think, an example of a particularly successful um, video that we did on Waiting for Superman and really had a lot of support from Paramount, who is our distributor on this film, and ended up being played with the trailer. So the amount of eyes that saw our video was rather unprecedented for us at the time. It was a lot, a lot of views. And um, having that type of support from your distributor was also really key for us because, like I said, we don't often have that. Okay, so here's the metrics. A lot of the times the metrics are not fun at all. Um, mostly because it's um, dealing with a lot of minutia. So 
being really diligent about um, all the content that we provide, and we typically create a lot of content on every one of our campaigns. This can be um, short form videos, um, like anything from 30 seconds to two minutes that we've created to either help explain the issue, maybe promote a particular NGO that's working on the issue that we think is really cool and, and has a solid model. Or it could be infographics um, that we're trying to seed out. One of the, one of the shorts that we put on, con that we did for Contagion, for example, just recently got nominated for a TED um, video prize. Um, it was also featured on the DVD of the film. So figuring out what the metrics behind each of those content pieces um, can be can be really difficult. So then figure, <coughs> keeping, keeping analytics on, obviously not just every time somebody's seen the video, but then if that video has been shared in any sort of private capacity with other organizations that you're working with, keeping metrics on that. Um, we try to keep metrics on everything. We've also hired statisticians <laughs> to do surveys with people. We had a very successful survey on, five, on Food Inc. We surveyed over 35,000 people, um, both before they watched the film and after they watched the film, to try to get an idea of how the film actually created behavioral change and thought change. Um, and so we, we take metrics on, on everything. We don't have a department within participant media that's solely responsible for impact, and that's something that we're developing now. So trying to make sure that there is, again, something of a rubric that we follow on every campaign to make sure that we're not just getting analytics, but we're actually starting to, to associate a value or a number to how somebody's thought patterns are starting to be changed as a result of your work, because that's really um, a driver for us. Yeah, so how do you measure the ROI on this effort? Is it the awareness of that campaign? Is it the number of people who participate in the campaign that you're talking about, or does it vary by project? Well, it varies by project for sure. But, so we would have two different returns on investment, right? The financial and then whatever the social return is. And how you measure the social return, I don't have a clue. So if you have some ideas, I'd be open. Okay. And that's what we're trying to figure out. So we're trying to figure out how do we associate metrics with something that is traditionally unmeasurable. Um, how somebody actually starts. So on Food Inc, we have so much anecdotal information as well. The fact that somebody, I swear every time um, in random places at bars or whatever, people tell me that they change the way they purchase food or they change the way they look at organics based on our film. And those are the things that we're trying to start to put metrics to, to figure out, okay, so how do, if we really want to change human behavior, what does that look like? And it's a process, so what does that process look like? And how do we value that? Um, but the idea would ultimately be to try to start to put value on, on those changes, whether they're behavioral or whether they're simply talking to a friend about those changes. Um, so I don't know. The, the return, the financial return on investment um, also actually takes a while before all of those financials are, are done, but that's easy. Those numbers are obviously easy to get. Um, so Food Inc., ironically, is one of those films that was both successful at the box office and incredibly successful um, in terms of the social action. I think the hashtag Food Inc. really became synonymous with the slow food movement during the time of its release, which is also a huge get. But how do you, how do you explain that to people that, you know, it's a really big deal that the hash, hashtag Food Inc. is everywhere on Twitter. And then explaining that to people that don't understand Twitter is another thing in and of itself. So how, what that process looks like is in development. But the fact that this is something that we're talking about in the company, that it's valued to measure these things, is actually a big deal. It took us a while to be able to hire a statistician to do these types of surveys. Because it's, there's a lot of fear around measuring that stuff. Because what if we made no impact? So the fact that we're able and willing, and I think honest enough with ourselves to start to make those measurements is actually, that was a big step. Yeah? Do you see a um, correlation or a relationship with the complexity of an issue, the complexity of an action, um, and its box office <laughs> returns in terms of the way audience engages, engage with you know, different types of films and actions? Uh, no. But, I mean, I think you have to make the barrier to entry for something as easy as possible. 
So I don't know if this is answering your question, but on the food inc, on the food inc survey, for example, we discovered after surveying 35,000 people that the people that already had some awareness of this issue actually craved um, more content and more nuanced content. So they really wanted to know specifics about particular threads of this issue. Um, but we also learned that people that knew nothing about it were interested enough to do something, even if that do something was to like think about it or talk to a friend about it or something like that. Um, I don't think it necessarily has any relevance to box office. What that connection between box office and social action is, is it's different for every project and we have no idea. The Cove, for example, had huge critical acclaim. It won the Oscar. The number of people that signed up to be part of the campaign rivals the success of anything that we've ever done. We had over a million people hungry for it. We still have people uh, emailing us about help them do fundraisers around the world for dolphin safety and all of that. It made no money. The movie made no money at box office. Somebody saw it. I would still argue that a lot of people haven't seen it because they're too scared to watch it, but they'll get involved in the campaign. So what the correlation looks like, I, I don't know. I actually think it's issue specific. I think there are some issues where it may be easier to draw that line between the two and others where it's just not. I think something that's more like kind of domestic and easy, or not easy, but like that people, something people get like um, waiting for Superman and, and education. Would that be... But Waiting for Superman didn't make very much money in the box office either, at least not what we hoped. Compared to many other documentaries, it was a nice figure, but um, compared to what we were expecting for that film, it, it wasn't. I don't know, we've asked ourselves the same question. Like, nobody's going to care about something that's happening on the other side of the world, like, save Dar Darfur now. That's why we said the box office was so low, because it was a complicated political issue, that didn't seemingly impact people's day to day. And I think there's some negative truth in that. But then you have an issue that's very close to home and does affect everyone's every day, and they still don't see it. So I don't know. Yeah? You, you mentioned a, like a figure as far as uh, our um, amount of films where it seemed like participants growing really quickly. Mm -hmm. And um, to me, that seemed like a really large number, so I'm wondering if that is reflective of the amount of money that a participant is making through this model, or if it's the fact that maybe you have uh, like a philanthropic founder and also like funding for that as well. I'm like, wondering how you um, are able to sustain that growth. Okay, so um, we did see a lot of success this year. I mean, the help did really well at the box office. Um, but no, I think this is just part of a, a longer term strategy. And it's not, it's a, also a result of finding success financially through acquisitions. So, so a lot of the films that we've acquired and have done well with Page One is a great example. It's a little documentary that actually did really well. Um, and we acquired it, we didn't produce it. So it cuts down on overhead costs, for example, by a pretty significant degree. So all of that growth was not gonna be through an expansion of production, but actually an expansion and acquisition. Um, it's part of a longer term strategy. So it's not anything that's a result also of just falling into a bunch of money. I happen to work for a company that is still very much supported by its founder who has no interest in stopping the company anytime soon. So we're in a bit of a unique place within that market in that respect as well. Does it answer your question? Yeah. Just to piggyback off that question, so then is it the Jeff Skoll Foundation that funds a lot of these social activist campaigns or do these um, films that you acquire, do they pay participant to lead these campaigns? How does that work? So it's different again on every project and ironically no, that tends to be something that we don't self-fund. It's largely funded by a P&A budget from our distributor. So um, P&A, which is a printed advertising budget, which is one of the first things that you're going to spend against in terms of distributing the film, we contractually usually reserve a part of that purely for social action. So a lot of the times on help being a perfect example, all of our social action work was paid for by Disney. So as part of the distribution package, they agreed to spend a certain amount of money on only social action related content. And as a result, they approve everything that we do. So we build a plan, um, send it to them and hope for the best, and they approved everything. They were phenomenally supportive and really great to work with, but they paid for all the social action work that we did. With the exception of staff time, we don't charge them obviously for our own overhead, but 
all the hard costs of doing social action was funded by them. And that's typically the case with most of our narrative films. Um, with documentaries, it's different, but again, those agreements look different on every project. Yeah? When you're uh, vetting all those different projects to decide which one to actually pursue, are you guys more considering the marketability of the film, like how easily it can get distributed and sold, or how easy like the social action campaign would be around it? Or is it kind of like a, a mix of, like, sh yeah, sure. So that's something I definitely can't speak to because I don't play any role in that whatsoever. But I would guesstimate that the social action really has nothing to do with the film selection outside of the identifying those issues. So those five key issue areas that I had talked about before, that those are issue areas that were basically largely honed in by this whole social action philosophy. And they try to adhere to that to a certain degree when they're doing their film selection. So something that falls outside of those issue areas entirely, we would pick up if we were maybe really looking to build a relationship with a certain studio or a director, would be my guess. But largely, the selection really falls within those issue areas. At least it certainly seems to have within the past few years. And I know that that's been, they've really made an effort to do that. Um, but outside of that, the social action feasibility doesn't have anything to do with the selection process. And we can really put a social action campaign to anything, to any films that we get. Um, but it makes more sense for us to do that within issue areas that we are already versed on and we think are going to have ultimately the most impact. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm just out of curiosity, do you ever find that uh, the promotions that the distributor do does uh, conflict with your own social action? That's a really good question. Um, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, so we're in a situation now where we're in the process of releasing. We have a distributor for a film called Last Call of the Oasis, which is a film about water scarcity. It's domestic focused. And um, we're with a distributor that we've never worked with before. Um, so it remains to be seen how some things are going to be played out. And I suspect there could be some slight um, conflict in that it's an issue about water scarcity. One of our tenants of the campaign is anti-water bottle use, so no plastic water bottles at all. Like We're really looking to ban the, the sale and use of plastic water bottles, largely on college campuses, so I'm going to be talking to you later about that. Um, but, and I can envision that without really knowing how important that is for us, our distributor may do events in which you might find a plastic water bottle so you could, I could see something like that happening, but by and large, no. And we have a good relationship with, um, with the people that we work with. So as long as we're communicating in an effective way, um, conflicts aren't likely to come up, yeah. Conflicts of that nature where they're literally like contradicting things that we're talking about aren't likely to I just had a follow up. What about, do you ever have situations where your just message is completely different? No, to... no. Because we, we work so closely together, we see everything that a distributor would put out and vice versa. And if that's not the case, then that's indicative of a much larger issue. And that never happens. I mean, we would get in way too much trouble if I put something out that somebody else didn't see. The amount of revisions and everything and approval of language and whatever is a very official, very templated process. So releasing press notes and all of that, those are all things that we've seen and approved. There wouldn't be, so it's unlikely that any sort of conflict in messaging would happen. Yeah. You referenced this, but how did the industry react to participant initially, um, given that it's so different with the double bottom line and with these um, social action campaigns? So, um, and, we can go through. Some of these metrics aren't totally accurate, by the way. They need to be revised. Um, so one of the things Jeff Skoll speaks to about this is he was told when he start, first started kind of um, coming up with the idea of creating participant media that people had told him the fastest way to lose all of their money is to start a film company 
are the fastest way to go from a billionaire to a millionaire <laughs> is to start a film company. <laughs> um, and I think by and large all of that sentiment was just disregarded and we did it anyway, or he did it anyway and found a lot of people that were in support of him. I think because of the projects, and that was one of the differentiators that I had talked about, the projects that we are, are going into are larger projects that help us establish relationships with other key studios in the market. And as a result, um, I think Participant is slowly, excuse me, I've only been there for five years, but I think as a result, Participant's reputation within the space has um, continued to gain credibility. Um, there are some projects that they've that we've picked up that have led others to question their credibility. But um, but no, I think the response is by and large, like, let's see what you can do. And if you're producing good film projects that people are actually watching, then yeah. So I feel like we have a, a unique but positive reputation in this space. And I've never sensed, in meetings with other studios, for example, I've never sensed any sort of like, Sentiment that would tell me otherwise. Can I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. One or two more questions. Okay, great. And this is, we can kind of skip through this. This is just, again, um, trying to take advantage. A lot of times the budgets that we do have in a PA spend, for example, are not super high. So we, we are still um, forced to adhere to sometimes really small budgets. So we try to get familiar with things that we can do quickly and easily or for free. Here are some examples. Um, or on the cheap. And then, what is the next? Oh, okay, in theaters, being consistent to the goals. If something's not working, let it go. Um, and uh, doing some cool stuff in theaters during box office is something we actually focus on more and more. So eventizing um, film releases, for example, bringing experts that can speak to issues into theaters. Um, local chefs, for example, around Food Inc., we drag them into the movie theaters opening weekend to try to get our box office numbers up opening weekends. Um, so all that sort of kind of creative, causey type stuff, we, we still really rely on to um, sell tickets. And I think that's about it. How do you guys um, figure out a balance between um, drama and um, documentary? I mean, the biggest films you've done are dramas. I mean, The Help is not a documentary. Most of the, the big films that we've heard of, other than a few, were the big traumatic releases as opposed to. How do you guys figure that out? It's usually an even split, actually. Our, our, our docket is usually very evenly divided between, or if not exactly evenly divided between documentaries and narratives. Um, and I think we just try to keep it as even as possible. So even with documentaries that don't have as big a name, for example, page one, page one in terms of the percentages would have made more than some of the other narratives that you probably have heard of. Um, so it just it just depends on, on what's coming in, but we do make an effort to try to make it equal. And I think that that's important, actually, a lot of... Um, a lot of the documentaries that we're working on, even if um, they're not necessarily well known, still have the potential. We have more leeway working within them, so I think we have the potential to possibly make more impact with them. So the social return there would probably be higher. Yeah? How did you end up working in your opinion? So my um, first boss at Participant was actually my boss at Amnesty International. <coughs> So networking, <laughs> yeah, so just kind of keeping in touch. And I had told this to Janet on the phone yesterday. The only reason I actually started working in sales is one, because I thought it would be really valuable skill to know how to sell stuff. I thought that it would ultimately help me in kind of like um, human rights work or politics someday or something. And the sales office I took a job at was next door to Amnesty. So I was just trying to like Weedle my way back into Amnesty after they lost funding for my position. So it just allowed me to kind of keep up those relationships. But my goal was always to work in some sort of, I studied international politics and human rights in college. So my goal was always to work in some sort of um, uh, cause marketing space. <laughs> yeah. So, um, 
No, and I've been a participant for five years now, and I love my job. And the people I get to work with are really kick-ass. Like, everyone is is on the ball and really knows what they're doing and super smart. So I, I feel really I feel really lucky. But it came through an Amnesty connection. The group of people that are working within, like, it was a Venn diagram of entertainment and, like, social change, and the connection between the two is pretty small. So that's why you see people jumping from good to participant and back and forth and cause and effect and all these other places. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much.